Class size seems to dwindle week by week. Maybe we'll need to do something about this. But, but as it dwindles, maybe you guys in the back can like come up front. because There's lots of room. That way I won't burn so many calories walking back and forth. Can you, please? Right, this, is my, this is my line in the sand today, right here. Five rows from the back. You guys? You? Yeah? 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 I know. I know. You're right, at, you're right on the border, but that is the border. No, you got to move forward. There's got to be a cutoff, you know. Morning. All right, so today, this week, we're going to talk about scheduling. We've, uh, you know, we, we basically, we started this unit about the CPU kind of right at the bottom. We talked a little bit about some of the things, uh, issues with the CPU that the operating system is going to try to correct. Uh, we discussed some of the abstractions that we create in the operating system to do that. Um, and today, we've kind of reached the top level, right? So we, you know, we started at hardware, we built up some useful abstractions, and now we're all the way up to, to the policy level where we're going to start talking about how we manage these abstractions we've created and also some of the ways that we try to get good performance out of the system, right? So this is, this is kind of, this is it. This is the last, this is the last hurrah for the CPU. Once we talk about scheduling, we're going to be finished. So this week, my goal is today to introduce you to scheduling, kind of talk about some of the goals of scheduling. Now, some of the presentations of scheduling I've seen don't really do this. They just kind of like jump right into to simple scheduling algorithms. But I think it's worth slowing down a little bit and talking about uh, what are the goals of scheduling, and also how do those goals connect with the way that you guys use your computers, right? So this is a way, this is a place where you guys can actually use some of the intuition that you've built up as actual computer users to think about how this stuff works, right? And I lost the slides, so. Yeah, I know. It's just, it's always one thing in the morning that I manage to forget. All right, cool. Um, so, and then on Wednesday, we're going to talk we're going to go through kind of a, a rapid fire introduction to a bunch of simple scheduling algorithms, and we'll talk a little bit about some slightly more complex scheduling algorithms and some, and some scheduling abstractions, right? So some, some abstractions that we use in the scheduling process, things we might assign to threads, different ways that we might think about how threads uh, compete or vie for the CPU, or different pieces of information that we might want to store along with the thread in order to, to do better scheduling. And then on Friday, uh, what we'll do is we'll spend one class and we'll look at uh, a real scheduling implementation in a little bit of detail, and that'll be the Linux 01 scheduler. And then after that, we'll also talk on Friday a little bit about um, issues with multi-core scheduling, which is kind of interesting, right? This is new. I'm trying to keep this class new and up to date, right? So uh, most machines now, including even you know low-end phones and, and tablets, are going to have multiple cores in them. So multiple core scheduling is kind of where it is. And there's some interesting uh, issues that arise in multi-core scheduling. So any questions about the, the plan? OK, a couple of announcements. So assi assignment one is out. Uh, how many people have started the assignment? OK, awesome. That's good, because I've been a week and a half, and I uh, get going. And again, so the last thing I need to do uh, today or tomorrow is to just finish getting, um, it, describing how we're going to do the testing. And I've kind, of, I've kind of reversed myself on that, but I'll update the website once I finish out what, what that means. A uh, week from Wednesday. Week. Yes, yes, at 5 PM. Um, and and it, look, I'm working on getting the slides up online. Uh, I get a lot of emails about this. Uh, some of the tone of those emails is, is a little irritating. Uh, you know, I, like, I understand that you guys want to have the slides. Uh, and I am aware of the fact that I would like to put the slides up online. One of the reasons I stopped doing it is if you go to that page, it takes like 10 or 15 seconds to load at this point. So the way I'm putting up on the slides online is not scaling. So I need to fix that. They're coming, OK? But sending me emails like, put the slides up online, you know, is, is not a good way to build uh, a, a, a beautiful, long, uh, and, and wonderful relationship with me. OK? Like, I know that the slides need to go up online, right? I, I, I don't appreciate getting little orders uh, over email, but, but they're coming, OK? Um, and hopefully that'll, that'll satiate people for like another five or six hours so I can buy myself some time to work. OK. All right, so let's talk about last week. Last week we talked about synchronization, synchronization week, right? Uh, you guys have an assignment that is out right now that is on synchronization. So. Uh, any questions arising either from the material that we went through or from the assignment or from the depth of your fevered imagination? 
Anything, any questions about synchronization? <coughs> anything, anything. So the assignment is just easy, straightforward, no problems. Okay, so let's do some review, starting in the back here. Concurrency is the illusion that Multiple things are running at the same time, yes. Everything, even. Everything would be great. Atomicity is the illusion that you're not sure. OK, let's keep going. Atomicity. What is atomicity? Concurrency is the notion that multiple things are happening at the same time. Atomicity is? Everything is isolated. Everything is isolated. In, what, in what sense? Uh, it has something to do with safety. Malik, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to call on people with hands up. I'm working the back of the room. But only one thing happens at the Not quite there. Do you want to help her out? One thing happens at the same time. We're trying to run out the clock back here. Robert, you want to help these guys? That you have the, you have the process by yourself, you have the system by yourself. That, that's, so that's, that's part of, of doing this, but what, what is atomicity? Right. Atomicity is the solution that something that actually takes multiple instructions, multiple changes to state on the CPU happens all at once. So there's no way to observe it at any point in between, right? I either see it, you know, I have a bunch of changes I need to make to some shared state, and either a thread sees it before I make those changes or after I make all the changes, right? So this is atomicity, OK? Questions about this. So it's important to understand this distinction, particularly these definitions. OK. Right, so let's talk about the assumptions that you cannot make. So people that are settling here in the back, I've encouraged everybody today to, to move forward, especially you, Vishwa. I like having you up in the front. Why not you come up? While, 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 while you're moving up a few rows, can you tell me one of the things that we can't assume anymore about threads? Unless explicitly synchronized, threads may. Why do we need synchronization? Uh, so that the access to shared resources is constrained. Right, right. But when I'm looking at when I'm looking at code, when I'm looking at what a thread's going to do, what are, what can I not assume about that? Yeah. So I can't, right, so I can't assume, so I have to assume that the threads can be run in any order, right? So interleaved execution is, is your new reality, especially for assignment one. Yeah? Also, they can be started and stopped. Again. They can be started and stopped at any time, right? This is preemptive context switching, right? What else? I heard, I heard it. Yes, they can be stopped for an arbitrary length of time, right? OK, I think that's it. All right. Let's talk about some of the signal interpretation primitives we talked about last week, OK? Locks. What is the interface to a lock? Two functions, right here. Uh, OK, get, which, you know, OK, acquire. And then what's the other thing I can do with the lock? Release. Release. Acquire and release. And acquire will sleep. And that's still wrong. Dang it. Oh, I shouldn't have cut and pasted. Now, I'm not going to jump up and down again, but you guys, you guys know what lock release does. <coughs> Damn it. Cut and paste fail. Um, OK, so yes, lock release will drop the lock. Lock release will not sleep, right? Look at me. Don't look at the slide. Look at me. Look at me. OK, what are locks for? What do I do with the lock? Right over here. Uh, for the uh, mutual exclusion. Mutual exclusion. Or what else do we call that? Critical, critical sections. Protecting critical sections. I acquire the lock at the top of the critical section, and I drop the lock when I leave the critical section. And Dropping and acquiring the lock defines what the critical section is. Right? There's, there's no notion of a critical section if you don't protect it using a lock or some sort of other device for ensuring mutual exclusion. Right? If you don't do that, then you don't have a critical section. You just have a bunch of stuff that may or may not happen in any order. Okay? What's the interface to a condition variable? Three functions. Let's see if we can get one at a time right over here on the right. Everyone? One. One out of three. No. Next, next, right here. What's the interface to a condition variable? Signal. Signal is one of them. OK, what else? Wait and right here. Eh. 
signal, wait, and post. Yeah, po post sounds like it. Post sounds like a fun call, but I don't know what it does. Yeah, broadcast. Okay, signal, wait, wait, signal, broadcast. Wait, waits on the condition variable until the condition changes. Signal signals one thread that the condition has changed. Broadcast signals all threads that the condition has changed. Okay. What do I use a condition variable for? Anybody? So it, this, so the condition variable provides a more flexible sig signaling mechanism than locks do, right? With a lock, really, I can only signal implicitly that a critical section is available or not available, right? Condition variables allow me to signal that a condition has changed, right? And, and that condition is usually uh, encapsulated in, in, a, in a what? In, in change to some shared state, right? It's a condition variable, right? The condition is that the variable has taken on some value, right? Or stopped taking on a value, right? Why are condition variables always associated with a lock? Anybody? Yeah? Because of the shared state, right? The lock protects the shared state, OK? And also, and also the lock allows me to tie together any changes I make to the shared state and the signals that I'm going to send to other threats, right? And if I don't do that, the shared state actually might change in some other way, right? So let's say on the last, let's say the buffer is full, using our example from last week, and I'm taking an item out of it. If I take out the item, I've changed the shared state. Maybe I use a lock for that, but maybe I drop the lock before I signal threads that are waiting to produce into the buffer, right? The problem is that in between the time I drop the lock and I send that signal, another producer may have run and already put something in there. So the condition that the buffer is available may no longer be true, right? And that's why we use a lock. That's why the condition variable interface requires that in order to signal and broadcast, you hold the lock, right? Because it ensures that the state that you are signaling hasn't changed. OK, questions about CVs, condition variables. You guys are going to have to use these on assignment one. Build them first, right? That's the fun thing. OK, deadlock. Deadlock occurs when what? What's the definition of a deadlock? Uh, let's see here. Uh, what about right there? Definition of deadlock. Yep. Don't remember the exact definition. What's that? Right. So, and 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 waiting in cycles for for will will that wait ever stop? No. Right. So so waiting is when a set of threads are waiting for each other to finish. And because of the cyclical nature of that, as you, as, as you pointed out, no one will ever wake up, right? So a, a deadlock is usually a very serious condition, right? Because there's no way to wake up the threads, and there's usually no way to, to, to break the cycle, right? Other than to do something drastic like kill a thread, right? Which could have all sorts of other weird consequences. Four conditions for deadlock, right? This is from last Friday. I know that was a long time ago, long weekend full of brain cell destroying activities, OK? But let's see if we can, if we can fire up the brain cells that stored this information, all right? So deadlock cannot occur. Four conditions. Anyone want to give me one? There's already one that's floating around the room, yeah. Right, so if I can take a shared resource away from a thread, then I can break out of a deadlock, right? Any deadlock, right? So that's one condition. What's another condition? Protected access to shared resources, right? So I actually have to, you know, if I don't need a lock to access a shared resource because I've done some, some tricky thing, you know, with the resource itself to make sure I don't need a lock, then I, then, yeah, then I don't need a lock and then I don't, I can't ever deadlock, all right? Three. Cyclic dependency, right? I need a cycle in my dependency graph, okay? And fourth, one more, we're really close, right? What's that? Priorities? Uh, no, that's not the one I'm looking for. Fourth, yeah. Multiple, and what does that mean? I, so what it means is that I can hold one resource while requesting another, right? If every time I needed a resource, I had to surrender all the exclusive access to resources I held, then I can never deadlock, right? If I only hold one resource at a time, there's no way for me to deadlock, right? Unless when, one small 
small catch to this, right? A single thread can deadlock. How? It tries to re-require a lock that already holds. OK, good. Ah, by attempting to require a lock. OK, good. So back to the top here, questions about synchronization. Right? Have people started to look at the synchronization problems, the little toy synchronization problems that we gave you on the assignment? Who's, who's looked at those? OK. Who's chosen a synchronization primitive to use to solve them? OK, now we're, now we're getting into the dregs. OK, get started on the assignment. Right? Because you guys actually have to implement those before you can even use them. Right? So the first part of this assignment is building your synchronization primitives and getting them to work. Okay? The second part is actually using them to solve the problems. Right? So you, know, you guys aren't even going to get to those synchronization problems until you have primitives that you can use reliably. Do you have a question? Yeah. Signal and broadcast, right? So if I have n threads that have slept on the condition variable, right? So they are waiting for the condition to change. And I call signal, the system will wake up one of those threads, only one. If I call broadcast, the system will wake up all of them, OK? And this came up, I think somebody asked about this toward the, the end of last class, right? So in general, I guess what I would say from a programming perspective, broadcast is safer. Because let's say I have a, you know, let's say I have a condition like the one that we discussed in the example that we did on Friday, which was that I had a buffer, and the buffer could be in three states. And I could have potentially, depending on the ordering in which threads run, I could have threads waiting on the condition to change. Some of them are producers, some of them are consumers, right? So some are waiting for one condition, some are waiting for the other. If I use CV signal, all I know is that I'm just going to wake up one thread. But I have no idea what thread's going to, to, to wake up. And unless you can really convince yourself that the thread that wakes up is always the right thread to wake up, then it can be safer to use broadcast. What's the problem with broadcast, though? Anybody? Manu? You look like you were raising your hand, so I'm going to call on you. <laughs> What's the problem with broadcast? Signal wakes up one thread. Broadcast wakes up all threads. What's that? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I'm, getting an, I'm cobbling an answer here from parts of, of multiple answers. What's that? Well, right. So what's the, the, the first thing, remember, CV signal, sorry, CV weight drops the lock, but when it gets up, it holds the lock. So the first thing CV weight has to do when it gets up is hold the lock again, right? So now I've got you know, n threads that are banging to get into the critical section, OK? And in many cases, what are, uh, what are many of those threads going to do again immediately? They're just going to call CV weight again, right? Because they're going to wake up, they're going to check the condition, the condition, isn't, the condition has changed, but it hasn't changed in the way that they wanted. Or maybe it changed, and by the time they woke up and checked it, it changed back right, to, the way that they were, the, to the way that they had, to what had originally caused them to wait. OK? So, so yes, broadcast will wake up all the threads. Right? And each thread will have to reacquire the lock, check the condition. And in many cases, many of those threads will immediately go back to sleep. Right? So you're paying the overhead of all that extra context switching and all, that extra, all those extra mechanisms to, to in order to perform the broadcast. On the other hand, again, unless you can convince yourself that signal will always wake up the right thread, right, or a thread that can actually do something helpful based on the condition, then it can be safer to use broadcast. Right? Pay the penalty, get it right. right? OK, any other questions? This is a good question. Any other questions about synchronization? Yeah. I'm not going to tell you how to implement it. <laughs> there, there, so my, my, my advice is to read the assignment and then to go look at how Semaphore is implemented and to use many of the things that are already there. But you may have to build some new features to, to, to do this. Right? One of the things I'm, I'm doing about the testing, the, the original testing scheme was to have you send us a couple files. I think we're actually going to invert that. right? So we're going to, I'm going to tell you, you apply a patch to this particular version of the kernel. And we're going to replace a couple files. But I want you guys to feel free to, for example, modify stuff in thread.c if you want to uh, change the primitives that we've given you, some of the array stuff, whatever. Right? Again, it's your kernel. So there's a small set of changes we will have to make for testing. But other than that, it's up to you to do that. So, so I'm not going to promise that all the functionality that you need 
to wake up and, and have threads go to sleep in the way that you will need to implement CVs is there. It might be, but I can't remember, actually. OK. OK, so today we're going to talk about scheduling. Yeah, that's all right. Um, I just had a question about the project. How are you yeah. doing the test reader writer lock? You don't give any like, formal definition of the names of the functions, so how are you going there? Oh, that's a good point, actually. So OK, good point. So we will probably have to require you to use a, a particular set of names, right? So I'll change the assignment to make sure that you guys use the set of names, and I'll give you what the interface is, right? Because we have a testing code for that, right, that we're not going to release. And, and as I stated in the assignment, this is a, an, an exception to our usual stated policy of, getting new, of giving you guys the testing suites that you need. But in this case, it's because we want you to build a test yourself, right? But you're right. Yeah, we do need to figure out what that interface is and standardize on the name. That's a great point. Stuff I don't think through. Careful. Okay, any other questions? All right, so again, so today we're going to talk about scheduling. We're going to focus on scheduling this week, right? So we, we, we've talked a little bit on and off about scheduling, and I think you guys know this, and that's there's a good chance for us to review some of uh, the stuff that we've done in, the, in our sort of CPU thread unit, right? So what, what is scheduling, right? Anybody want to venture a guess? Roger Schwartz. Well, it's basically a process and a mechanism in which you try to make sure that all the threads get access to all the resources. OK, so now, now you're, you're telling me what scheduling is trying to do, right? But what is it? Just like, what, 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 is, scheduling, what is scheduling doing, right? Uh, OK, I'm, so scheduling is going to use the mechanism of context switching, OK? It's switching between threads, right? Now, forget the time run up for now, right? Scheduling is just when the operating system has a choice about which thread should have access to the core or cores, how do I choose which thread will run, OK? So it's the process of choosing the next thread or threads to run on the CPU or CPU, right? Again, for most of the next day and a half, I'm going to talk about this as if it's a single core system, right? Some of the algorithms that we'll talk about will generalize easily to multiple core systems, and others don't. And there are some other interesting issues that arise in multiple core scheduling. Again, we'll talk about that on Friday, right? And I just said that. Yeah, good. OK, I get ahead of myself. All right, so next question. Why, why do I need, why schedule threads, right? Why, why is this necessary? Fundamentally. Right, I've got this illusion of concurrency, right? And the illusion of concurrency is based on, you know, the, the, the reality is, is, is required because of the reality that there are more threads than there are processors. And so I have to make a choice. If I had a core, for every thread on the, on the system. I wouldn't have a scheduling problem, right? I would just hand out, I would say to each thread, I'd say, here's your core, go have fun, right? And you know, you never need to stop running, so I never need to make this choice, right? So again, this scheduling is, is, the, is the policy of how we implement this abstraction of concurrency, right? And this, this goes back to our earlier discussion about multiplexing and why the kernel needs special privileges, right? So this is another case where I'm multiplexing a resource. I'm dividing up the core cores that I have between the threads that are active on the system. And in order to do this, I, I need these special powers, right? So the kernel needs to be able to tell a particular thread, you're, you're done. You can, you're not going to run anymore for now. I need to use the CPU for another core, right? And, and this is one of those things that, that applications submit to as part of running on the system. Right, is allowing the CPU, sorry, allowing the operating system to gate their access and control their access to resources, including the, the CPU. Okay? Any questions about this? This is review going back a couple weeks. So I thought it was kind of good to talk about. Okay, when does the scheduler run? Ben. Uh, okay, when, when the timer interrupt goes off, when else? There's actually, I've got four things up on this slide. That's one of them. Right? When else does the timer, when else does the schedule, does the, the operating system get to schedule a threat? On, okay, so context switching is the mechanism, right? All of these involve a context switch. Uh, uh, one, one at a time. Yield. Good. Okay, we're going to talk about yield on the next slide. We haven't really talked about yield yet, but I'm going to talk about yield. So yield is when a thread will actually say to the operating system, hey, like I could keep running, but I don't want to. You know, I'm, I'm going to let you make a another scheduling decision, you know? 
Like, I'm, I don't need your help with anything right now, and I'm not necessarily waiting for anything to happen, but I just kind of want to be descheduled. You know? and, and, and a thread might decide to do that if it's like a nice thread. Right? OK, yield, hardware interrupt. Sorry, timer interrupt. What else? And, and, and how do I block for input? When a thread asks the kernel for help with something, right? When the thread makes a system call. Because I trap it to the kernel, I context switch into the kernel, and now if the kernel wants to, it can stop that thread. Now, whenever I make a system call, whether it's a non-blocking system call that can return immediately, or a blocking system call where the thread has to wait until something happens, I have a chance to make a scheduling decision, right? Because the operating system has started to run. Okay? In the case where it's a blocking system call, I have to schedule another thread, right? Because that thread cannot be run for some period of time until something else happens, right? A disk I.O. completes or whatever. Yeah. When a, when a thread exits. All right, you guys are good, right? You got all four. Voluntary yield, which again, we're going to talk about on the next slide. Blocking system calls. Thread exit and when the kernel decides that the thread has run for long enough, and the way that this is implemented is, as Ben pointed out, through a timer interrupt, right? So number four. Now, I can have, I, you know, depending on the system, I'm trying to think of if I would have some mixture of one through three, but I would probably have, definitely have one through three, right? When a thread exits, clearly I need to run another thread. When a thread asks me for help, especially if it's a blocking system call, I definitely can't run that thread, so I have to choose something else to run, right? And if a thread calls yield, then again, what it's asking me to do is to stop it, right? So I, sh I should probably do that, or at least it's giving me an opportunity to stop it, right? The existence of number four is what differentiates preemptive and cooperative scheduling policies. So on a, preemptive scheduled, on a preemptively scheduled system, the kernel can stop a thread at any point, right? Whether or not the thread has asked to be stopped, exited, or made a blocking system call, and we talked about the mechanism for that. And can someone remind me what it is? Ben just said it. How, how do I implement preemptive scheduling? How do I give the kernel a chance to run? Through a timer interrupt, right? So the timer interrupt causes the system to trap into the kernel. And at that point, I'm allowed to stop the thread that's running and choose something else to run, OK? So number four, if, if number four exists, I have a preemptive scheduling policy. I can stop a thread that hasn't asked to be stopped. If number four doesn't exist, and I have a cooperative scheduling policy. And the points that the kernel is allowed to make scheduling decisions are on some level determined by the applications themselves. Right? So an application that sits in a while one loop for a long time may not ever give the kernel a chance to make another scheduling decision. Right? So that could be bad. That's why we have preemptive scheduling. Okay? So let me talk about yield just for a sec, because this hasn't come up earlier. So kernel threads, and I don't know if there's actually an interface in the, in the, uh, in the standard uh, Unix uh, system call interface, if there's a call to do this. But I, I would be, wouldn't be surprised if there is. But particularly in the kernel, kernel threads can call a function called thread yield. And yield is essentially a way of, we talked about before how threads transition between different queues, right? So if I make a system call, I go from the running queue to the waiting queue. Yield is how I move from the running queue to the ready queue directly. right? And I do that voluntarily. I say, again, for, for right now, I don't need your help with anything, but I would just like to be stopped. right? And this, and this could be a good thing. right? I mean, this might, you know, a thread woke up. It checked whether it had any work to do. It didn't have any work to do, and it doesn't have anything else to do. right? So it essentially says, hey, I'm, I'm finished, and I would like to yield. So this is, this is a voluntary mechanism allowing well-behaved threads to tell the CPU, hey, I'm, 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 I don't have anything else to do right now. So if you have another thread to run, then that would be a good thing to do. Right? And yield is essentially a, a cooperative mechanism. Right? It allows a thread to explicitly tell the kernel that it's not doing anything important anymore. Right? You may not, the may, thread may not have anything else to do at all. Right? OK. So let's talk about policy versus mechanism, because we've come to the point in our discussion of the CPU where this split is nice and clear. Okay? So we talked a little bit about early in the class how one of the goals of the system is to separate policy and mechanism. Right? And separating policy and mechanism allows me to separate their implementations. Right? Allows me to, for example, write a variety of different scheduling policies right, that how, 
that decide how to choose the next threads while relying on the same fundamental underlying mechanisms. Yeah? Uh, one shift uh, that gives away the control to kernel to use, how does it tell the kernel that when do I give the control back? The kernel makes that decision, right? Okay. You're essentially telling the kernel, I'm done for now. I'd like to be, like, you know, I'm still, I'm still alive, right? I'm not blocked waiting for something. But you decide when to run me next, right? So that's, that's one of the things about yield. You, know, you don't have that, necessarily have that control, OK? So let's talk about, and, and we t we've already talked about this stuff, right? We spent most of this unit talking about mechanisms, right? We talked about context switching. We talked about threat abstractions, which are a way of kind of organizing information that's necessary to do some of this stuff, right? We switch between threads by you know, moving it between these queues, right? Those queues are abstractions, but moving this, you know, putting things back and forth, this is all mechanism, right? The context switch is mechanism, right? And now we're going to talk about the policy. So this is going to be what we're going to do this week. But let me just go through this because I want to make sure that this, this, this split is really clear, right? Because the fact that this split exists is, is a really useful design principle, right? OK, so deciding what thread to run, policy or mechanism. Uh, policy or mechanism? Anybody? Uh, policy. Uh, policy. Who said mechanism? mechanism? Why? Because the context switch, we have to get to it with how we check the runnable queue. Right. And then determine the next thread to run. Right. Okay. But, but that determination itself is a policy decision, right? The con OK, so maybe we can contrast this. Context switch. <laughs> mechanism. Right? Maintaining the ready, running, and waiting queues. <laughs> Mechanism, right? What about if I have something that gives preference to interactive jobs? Policy. 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 Using time runups to stop running threads? Mechanism. 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 Choosing a thread to run at random? Policy. 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 Okay, you good. <laughs> I know you can tell by the indentation, but you weren't supposed to. I just, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm only, I only have so many skills, okay? I, I did think of that, though. And I actually, originally the slide said policy and mechanism, but then it was too obvious, right? So you're right, it's still the one. OK. The last thing I want to impress on you as you guys look into this, and, and this is going to be hard to really drive home, because unfortunately, on OS 161, we've never had great workloads that will bring out different features of scheduling. So for assignment two, we're actually going to ask you to write an experiment with a couple of simple thread schedulers, right? The problem is that we don't have a realistic workload that allows you to say, oh, this thread scheduler is way better than this other one, right? So I'm just going to have to try to, to argue this from first principles, right? But the fact is that how the CPU is scheduled and how I make this decision is really incredibly important to how the system runs. Why is that, right? Why, and why in particular is the CPU so important to schedule, right? There's all these other parts of the system. Why is the CPU so critical? How I do the CPU right here? Yeah. You don't know. What about working down the road toward the coat rack? I don't know either. He doesn't know. Why is the CPU so important? The CPU manages all the other devices. It manages all the other devices. That's, that's close enough. No, no, but, but in, so if I want to use the disk, what do I have to do? I have to use the CPU, right? It, well, I don't know if it's a main computer. The computer, I think, is the, the whole collection. It right? it, it's required to use every other device, right? If I want to use memory, I need to use the CPU. If I want to use the disk, I need to use the CPU. If I want to use the network card, I need to use the CPU. Right? So this, how I schedule threads determines their access to essentially every other resource on the system, right? And we'll talk later about how I divide up other resources like memory, for example, right? But a thread that's not scheduled can't use its memory. So there might be memory sitting around waiting for it where it stored stuff that it wants to come back to. But as, if it doesn't have the CPU, it can't use it. It can't request more, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So this is why CPU scheduling ends up having such a huge impact. Okay? So and, and intelligent, the difference between intelligent scheduling and, and, and stupid scheduling is essentially the difference between a computer that you like and a computer that you don't. Right? Intelligent scheduling will make your system seem really fast and responsive, even if it's like an old 
I don't know. I mean, old 386s probably just don't seem responsive anymore, period, right? Um, but, you know, maybe if it's an old, like, I don't know, you know, old, old, sort of late model uh, Pentium 4 or something, right? Depending on what you're doing, I mean, if you have a smart system, right, and allocates resources well, it'll make your system seem really good. And stupid scheduling will make your system seem terrible, right? Really slow and sluggish, yeah. So how much of it depends on the, the scheduling process and the code and Again, I mean, one way of thinking about it is that the hardware inside your computer is not changing, right? So once you buy a computer, you have a fixed set of resources. And at that point, it's all about how those resources get used, right? You, you're right that to some degree, I would argue that, that it, comp the computer systems community has gotten out of having to write really sophisticated schedulers. And the reason is that hardware just has kept getting so much faster. Right? So hardware has kept bailing us out. Right? You, know, you, you, you get this new version of Microsoft Word, and it's slow and terrible. And then you get a new machine, and it runs OK for a couple weeks. Right? You know, so that's kind of like, that's been the story of technology. Now, some of those curves are starting to flatten out. Right? So I think it, and especially on, on mobile devices. Right? I mean, some of those curves are, are really much more battery dependent than they used to be. But the point is that, yes, to some degree, hardware has, has continued to move the bar. Right? So yes. If you have a system that has a dumb scheduling policy, the best way to make it better is to add some more, you know, or, or a good way to make it better, a guaranteed way to make it better, is to add some more RAM or add a faster processor. Okay. So this is, this is how I decided to break down kind of the interaction between what you expect from your computer and, the, and what the scheduling discipline provides, right? So I want to I start with kind of how people use their computer, how you guys use your computer, and use that to evaluate the different scheduling disciplines, OK? So when you're using your machine, I think that there are three, th this is my taxonomy, but I think there are three things that we expect from our computers, right? The first is that when I do something, it responds, right? It's responsive. When I click on something, it, it indicates that something has happened, right? It may not finish what I ask it to do immediately. Right? But it gives me some feedback that says, oh, I've started that. Or, or maybe if what I'm asking it to do seems pretty easy, it finishes rapidly. Right? The second, which I think is, is, is interesting and, and more a function of, of media on computers, is this idea of the computer continuing to perform some regular task in a smooth and well-defined way. Right? So what's an example of something like that that you guys do all the time? Watching video, for example? MP3s? Audio? Things like this, right? So these are examples of something, and I kind of think of this as active waiting, right? I started something, and, I ex and, and I'm, I'm paying attention, right? I'm not interacting with the computer, but I will notice if the computer doesn't do a good job of scheduling, right? If the audio starts to skip, you know, if the video sits there and starts buffering or starts getting all choppy or whatever, you, you will notice that, right? Despite the fact that it's not really interactive, I think, in the, in the usual sense of interactive. And then the final thing I expect my computer to do is to finish things that take a while, right? So, you know, there, I, I think sometimes there's two kind of things we ask our computers to do. There's the ones that we're willing to wait for, and then there are ones that we're not willing to wait for, right? And that we just expect to happen like overnight. So last night, you know, I backed up my, my wife's laptop again. It had to start over. And it took, you know, 13 hours or something, right? And I didn't spend 13 hours staring at the progress bar, right? I probably, you know, 10 years ago I might have. Um, but now I've kind of come to this attitude where it's like, you know what, computer, like, that's fine. You know, I, I'll forget about this as fast as possible. And then maybe when I wake up in the morning, you'll be done. And, and it, it had just finished like 15 minutes after I woke up, right? So it's like, OK, it really did take a while, right? So, so let's talk about how these expectations map down into scheduling policies, OK? So again. Responsiveness. When I give the computer input, it, it, it responds in a timely way, right? It may not finish the thing I asked it to do, but at least it gives you some, some you know, uh, feedback that it started, that it kind of understood what you wanted it to do, right? And this constitutes most of what humans do with our computers, right? Most of what we do with our computers is interactive, interactive activities, right? There's actually much, much fewer examples of the other two here, although they might be equally important. And think about it. I mean, that's kind of what makes computer the, entirely what makes computers different than television, right? Television is totally passive, right? Computers are interactive. We expect computers to do this. Right? Te television, okay, if you change the channel, you expect it to do something. 
So give me, ex I mean, this is obvious stuff, but give me some examples of responsive tasks, right? What's something that you would do that you expect the computer to respond to? Robert. Uh, when I click an icon, it starts a Exactly, right? So, you know, web browsing. When I click on a link, it starts to retrieve the web page, right? If I'm editing, I'm typing things at, at, at the keyboard. Every one of those keystrokes creates, you know, more data that's being read by that program and displayed on the screen, right? And then chatting, right? If I hit send, I actually want the chat program to, to do that, right? And when these, when these programs violate our expectation, it gets, it gets very frustrating, right? So I've been, I've been using a Google Voice chat program for the past uh, three, four months. And I like it on some level, but it has this irritating feature where maybe 10% of the time when you type a little text message and hit send, it takes like 10 minutes, right? So I'm sitting, it's sitting there spinning, right? And you're like, are you ever going to finish, you know? And so some, I've realized that it actually does finish, so I just put it back in my pocket and, and wait for it to get done, right? But for a while, I would wait for 10 seconds, and I would kill it because I would think it was broken. or so, Probably it is broken. There's clearly something broken about it, right? But, but yeah, so when, the, when these programs violate our responsive expectations, using a computer becomes very frustrating, right? All right, so again, c continuity, right? Continuing to perform some task that has deadlines, right, over time. And as I pointed out, as we started to use our computers as media devices, this is more and more important, okay? And examples of this we already kind of went through, right? But I like the top one, right? Cur blinking the cursor, okay? And that seems kind of like a stupid thing. But if you were sitting there at your computer and you had a terminal window open and you hadn't disabled the blinking cursor, which I very kindly did for all of you on the virtual machine that you're using for this class, right? because for some reason Ubuntu now has a blinking cursor by default, which drives me insane, right? But if you were sitting there and the cursor was like, blink, 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 you know? Like, you'd be like, what is going on, you know? You'd start to poke around, and there's some big background process that's running and killing up anything. So, so anyway, so this is an example of something as dumb as it sounds, right? That really does, you know, your expectations are that cursor is going to blink really, really regularly, right? Playing music or movies is another thing, right? I mean, there are, there are buffers on these cards, but they're small, right? And so on a regular basis, I've got to feed more audio data into the buffer on that audio card so that it doesn't stop, right? Or skip or do something else, right? And then little things in JavaScript on your, on your web browser, right? I mean, those, again, have some sort of regularity, OK? And then finally, these background tasks, right, are completion-oriented. I couldn't find a good term for this, so I used three interchangeably. Um, and, and completion implies this passive waiting, you know? Like, you, you've asked the computer to do something, and you kind of want it to finish at some point, because if it doesn't finish, it's really going to get annoying. Um, but in the meantime, you maybe want to use your computer for other things, right? You want to watch a movie. You want to continue to interact with it, right? You don't want it to just shut down completely, you know, until the background task finishes, right? Until I finish my backup, this thing just stops, right? So other than backup, can anybody think of other examples of these kind of tasks? What's that? Installation is a good one. Anything else? Virus scans. Virus scans, yeah, exactly. Um, and a lot of these are, are, are not user initiated, right? A lot of these are initiated by your expectations about how the system runs, right? So for example, a system backup, I've set up my system to backup you know, certain, at certain intervals. And I just want that to happen, right? Indexing files on your computer, I think, is a good example. Because why, why, do you do, why does your computer do this background indexing? Why? Because when I search, it's fast, right? Like, it's, it's essentially front-loading a task. So when I start you know, typing to the spotlight bar on my Mac, things come up really quickly. The reason they come up really quickly is not because it's doing a live search. It's because it's already built the index, right? While the computer is sitting there you know, serving a slideshow or something like that, OK? So and again, I mean, most applications combine some mixture of these activities, right? So a music player, you know, Changing tracks, that's a click responsive expectation, right? What, you know, playing the track is the watch, and then the finish oriented task is updating album artwork, right? That just kind of, that's just supposed to kind of happen, right? Without my really noticing. Web browser, follow a link, play web video, index my search history, right? So any questions about this, this taxon? I'm hoping that this, this maps down well to the expectations you guys have about how you use your computers, right? So, now going back to scheduling, right? So the idea of scheduling is what we're trying to do is we're trying to balance, right? Two things. One is meeting deadlines, 
Okay, and I'm going to talk about how deadlines are involved in two of these uh, user expectations in a second, right? And the other is optimizing resource allocation, right? So here's a little brain exercise to help you think about how these two things compare, right? You know, you guys graduate from SUNY Buffalo, you get an A in this class, you know, you get a job at Facebook because, you know, they know how awesome you are because you took this class and you got an A. And, you know, every week it's kind of like you, you know that there are these ongoing tasks, you're building a new feature for the site or whatever. And, you know, on Monday morning, you go into work and you kind of say, okay, how am I going to plan out my week, right? How am I going to plan out my week and, and kind of optimize my own resources so that I get a lot of work done on these, on these tasks that I'm, I'm trying to finish, right? Okay, and you, and you sit down, you do that, and you've got everything all in place, and, and you're kind of working away on whatever feature it is that you're working, and you're, inter you know, you're interacting with other people, and there's a lot of different resources you have to use. And then, you know, Mark Zuckerberg walks in and is like, hey, you know, there's a bug in the thing that you built you know, two weeks ago, you know, that is crashing the site, okay? You need to fix that right now, okay? And then this really nice plan that you had for the week, the really nice plan that you had for the rest of your afternoon, the concert tickets that you had for that night, the you know, reservation at the really hard to get into restaurant in San Francisco that you made, it's all over, right? Like you are ASAP, get this thing done as fast as possible, doesn't matter, right? So, and, and systems are kind of constantly torn between these two things, right? On one hand, in order to get some of these background tasks done and to do a lot of other useful work, they're trying to carefully allocate resources. But then when you click on the link, it's like, whoa, okay, you know? Perception delay, I've got five seconds to redraw the screen, and then I've got to go get this web page, right? So that's, you know, think, think about your computer. You know, you're sitting here in class, and it's kind of sitting there being like, okay, man, I'm planning my next five minutes, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that search indexing, et cetera, et cetera. And then things get boring in class, and you start looking on YouTube, and it's like, whoa, you know, now I, now, now I have deadlines, right? And, and I think of, you know, responsiveness and continuity are about deadlines. Right? Responsiveness is about meeting unpredictable deadlines. Suddenly you sit down and act with a computer and there's a new set of deadlines and those deadlines are driven by you, right? Your keystrokes, your input, your clicks, okay? Continuity-based tasks are a little bit different, right? Continuity-based tasks establish a set of deadlines in the future that the system now has to meet at regular intervals, right? So that's the difference. When you start playing a video, you've essentially set up two hours worth of small little deadlines for your machine that it has to meet, right? And if it doesn't meet one of those, you'll get irritated, right? Because again, the movie will stop or skip or whatever, okay? Throughput, on the other hand, and being able to finish these completion-oriented tasks requires this careful resource allocation, right? So this is, in my opinion, this is the big, you know, this is the big tension in scheduling, right? How do I have a computer that's interactive and useful for doing continuous things like watching video and playing music, while at the same time does a good job of optimizing its resources? Here's the thing, though. Humans notice deadlines and responsiveness, okay? You notice if your screen stops refreshing, right? You notice if the movie skips. What you don't notice is resource allocation and how effective it is, right? So for example, you hear people say this all the time, my computer feels slow, you know? Like, my computer is feeling a little sluggish, you know, I think I need to take it to the Mac bar so they can like, you know, scrape some mud off the tires or something, I don't know. Um, has anybody heard anyone ever say this? Okay. You've got dork friends, that's good. <laughs> so, wait, but tell me the story though, quickly. Um, I worked at Union Micro. Okay, okay. So, I, so I, think, I think my intuition is that this is a much less common thing for somebody to say, right? Most of us have really very little idea on a day-to-day -day basis how many resources our computers are consuming. We just don't know, right? I hope that thing's using all of its RAM. I don't know. I have no clue. I, all I know is that it's not as fast as it used to be, you know? It doesn't feel fast. It feels sluggish, right? So, and again, this, and this is fundamentally going back to that thing that we talked about before, right? Your time, computer time. Responsiveness wastes your time. Okay? And that's irritating, right? And your time is actually really important, I would argue, right? And the poor throughput is just the computer time, right? So, you know, my computer last night had to work overtime to finish that backup, right? But I don't care, you know? I, I you know, it's, it's pay, it, it doesn't make very much an hour, right? I don't know what electricity costs to power that thing, but it's not that much. 
So this is, so as we talk about schedulers starting tomorrow, right, this is how I want you guys to think about how, do you evalu how we evaluate schedulers, right? Can the scheduler meet deadlines, right? Can it meet unpredictable or continuous predictable deadlines? And how well does it completely and fully allocate system resources? And as I talked about before, how I allocate the CPU has a big impact on how the rest of the system resources get allocated and used, right? And again, on human-facing systems, interactivity is almost always wins. There's usually big, big sort of biases in the direction of interactivity on these types of systems, right? Because, you know, humans don't want their time wasted. And your time is much more precious and in some ways meant much less compressible than computer time, all right? Okay, just one quick note here before we leave. So I'm not gonna talk about real-time scheduling because there's a whole class here that, that looks at real-time operating systems. But, but again, so we've established that deadlines are important, right? And deadlines are important because when computers don't meet deadlines, human users get annoyed, okay? On real-time system, deadlines are the only thing that that system is allowed to care about, right? And it's because, you know, like, if the robot task forgets to turn off the motor because it was, you know, I, I don't know, if it's like running to backup or whatever, and it goes two feet too far, then, you know, like there's the end of your, you know, $2 billion in Mars Pathfinder mission or whatever, right? So on real-time systems, you know, you, you, like deadline, meeting deadlines is completely critical, right? On human-oriented systems, meeting deadlines is just the thing that we focus on a lot, okay? All right, next time we're going to go through simple policies. We're going to go through some scheduling abstractions, and we will talk more about this stuff. See you on Wednesday.